The Muslims teach that the Mahdi will lead a revolution to establish a new world order and defeat the nations of the world. And that's what the Bible says the Antichrist will do. Revelation 13, 7 says he will have power over all kindred and tongues and nations. They believe the Mahdi, listen to this, will make a seven-year peace treaty with the Jew of priestly Lenin. Daniel chapter 9 tells us that the Antichrist will come, confirm a covenant with many of the Jews for seven years. We call that seven years the tribulation period. They believe the Mahdi will conquer Israel for Islam and lead the final battle against the Jews. Well, again, I've already told you how the Antichrist enters Jerusalem and tries to kill all of the Jews, and he will kill some of them, and so they're going to love him for that. They believe the Mahdi will have power over wind, rain, and crops. You know, the Bible says that the Antichrist and the false prophet will both be able to perform great miracles that will deceive the people of the world. They believe the Mahdi will rule for seven years, after which the prophet Jesus, yes, they look at Jesus as a prophet. The prophet Jesus will return, and the final judgment of evil will take place. You know, I almost got this one right. Except it won't be the body ruling for seven years. It'll be the Antichrist. Unless, of course, that's the same person. And it won't be the body making judgment at the end of that seven years. That'll be King Jesus doing that. Yeah. Have you noticed that Islam still practices execution by beheading people? Well, we've seen that on the TV. The Antichrist, according to Revelation 24, will behead many, many martyrs of, of the faith during the tribulation. And let me just say one more. Islam is not just a religious system. It's also a political system. Although the Antichrist starts with a separate global religious system and political system, he eventually claims to be the head of all of it, both sides of it. Now that's just nine examples, and we could go on and on here, of the similarities taught about the Antichrist in the Bible and the Mahdi in the Quran and Hadith. But does this guarantee us that the Antichrist and the Mahdi are in fact the same person? That they're going to accept the Antichrist as their Mahdi? No, you cannot make that statement positively. First of all, remember I said the side to side theory is just that. It's a theory. So we don't know that, that, that Donald Rock will be sitting in the outer court of the temple. Secondly, I have some problems with the idea that the Muslims would accept any man who claimed to be God. Because they don't believe any man can be God. That their God, Allah, whom they call Allah, is a spirit in, in heaven somewhere, but you cannot be God and be man. So I, I, I think they'd have a problem with that. So I can't state with certainty that the Antichrist will ally himself with the Muslims in his conquest of Israel but I think there's reason to believe it's a good possibility. So in summary, what does all this stuff mean to me and you as Christians? Number one, it tells us that Islam has become a great power in our world today with some 1.3 billion followers. There has to be some significance to that. You know, until 9-11-01, most of us didn't even know what a Muslim was, huh? Now everybody knows. They become a great world power. Islam teaches nothing less than world domination through the forced submission of all people to the tenets of this religion. <laughs> Listen, I know it's not politically correct to say it, but I'm not a politician, so I'll say it. Islam is a religion of the sword. Their method of evangelism is very simple. Either you convert and believe as we believe, or we'll kill you. It works. It works a lot. And so, Islam has, has every intention of dominating the whole world. It's possible, I said possible, that the Antichrist spirit of Islam may lead the Muslims to believe that the Antichrist is their normal way to body. And they will ally themselves with him and become his devoted followers. Now that's, again, I say that's possible. There's no way we can prove it or disprove it. And finally, I would say this, in conclusion, that the storm clouds are building in the Middle East today. ISIS has got everything in the turmoil. The Muslim nations are all in upheaval. The Middle East 
is going to become the center, and Israel specifically will become the center of attention for the whole world. All of this together, I think, points to the conclusion of the church age. Think about it. The preparations being made now for the tribulation temple. The rise of the Islamic nations in the last few decades and the power of the fanatical Muslims in the world. The present common distrust between the East and the West and this ongoing war against terrorism, which by the way is just another way of saying a war against fundamental Islam. All of this points to the nearness of the tribulation period. Which, even though it will be a time of unparalleled pain and heartache and suffering, for us as Christians, it creates a great deal of excitement. Why? Because we know the Bible teaches that the Lord is going to rapture His church before the tribulation begins. You say, how can we know that, Brother Al? Well, that will take another whole hour for me to tell you that. Maybe we'll do that tonight. And so we have to conclude, here's where our conclusion is, we have to conclude that we're now leave, living in the season of our Lord's coming. We're living in the very last of the last day, the end of the church age. I believe with all my heart that Jesus is coming soon. Now I said that last year, the year before that, the year before that. I don't think I've been here. But every year I've been here, I've been saying that. But do you remember, you know that three or four years for the sake of history, thousands of years of history, three or four years is a very tiny, minuscule piece of history. We're living in the season. How long is the season going to last? I don't know, but I don't think it's very long. If he doesn't come between now and this year, and Brother David would see fit to ask him to come back next year, I'll be saying it again next year. Because I know we're very close. We're getting very close. Now, if you don't believe all this stuff is true that I told you, then on March the 5th, you sign up with me. We'll go to Israel together and I'll show it to you. You can see it with your own eyes. I'll take you to the Temple Institute. And you can see the preparations being made. You can talk to the rabbis and ask them for yourself. I'm telling you what I've seen. What I know to be the truth. And of course, all of it is built upon the end indisputable foundation of God's holy word. Amen. It's all for the Lord. My question for you tonight, this morning is if the Lord does come for His people, would you be ready for that? If the Lord would have come tonight, would you be ready to meet your Lord in the air? Just because you're saying that you're included in the rapture doesn't mean you're ready for the rapture. Remember the first thing you're going to have to do when the Lord raptures us and carries us to heaven is you're going to have to stand and give an account to Him of how you live your Christian life. And I'm telling you, a lot of Christians in our churches today are doing a very poor job of living the Christian life. They stand before the being received judgment of Christ and have to give an account of their, 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 their life as a Christian. The Lord's going to say to some, well done. And to others, he's just going to say, well. And they're going to hang their heads. Well, oh, and I guess I didn't do very much. The Bible says they're going to be saved as though by fire. They'll stand empty before God with nothing to show. And I'm telling you that the sense of regret and shame those people will be Did he get included in the rapture? Yeah. Were they ready for it? No. So my question again to you this morning is, are you ready? Are you ready? Because it's coming. It happened even this very day. I'm asking if you will to bow your heads with me for just a moment. Brother David's going to come to the front here. I want to ask a question of Christians who are here this morning. If you were to stand before the Lord today and give an account of 
how you've lived your Christian life. Would you think you think the Lord would be pleased with the way you've been living your life? Would He look at you and say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Would He say that to you? Or would you have to hang your head very ashamed and walk through the gates and enter the kingdom knowing that you'll have no reward because you did not serve. How many Christians here today would confess their sins to God? Their shortcomings. Because the Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, then God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Would you confess and just say, Lord, I, I know I haven't really been doing everything all for you. Doing, I haven't really been serving you the way I should. Lord, I want to start fresh today. I want to begin new with you today. Would you make that confession to God? Right where you are. If you would, just lift your hand up as a sign unto God and say, Lord, I confess my sin. I should be living more faithfully for you. I should be doing more for you. How many Christians in here would make that confession to God? Raise your hand. Amen. Amen. Runs going, hands going up all over the Amen. Now you didn't do that for me. It didn't matter that much to me. Well, it matters, but it's not going to be any skin off my nose if you're not living for the Lord. But listen, it's between you and God. It's between you and God. Anyone else want to make that confession? Say, Lord, I, I, I really probably ought to be doing a lot more than what I'm doing. Amen. Yes. Anyone else? Quick. Yes, ma'am. God see your hand. Amen. Let me remind you, you're never too young nor are you too old to serve in God's kingdom. There's a place for every Christian to serve. Father, I thank you for these dear people for their patience and listening. I hope I've showed something to the Lord to help them realize that we're living in the very last moments of the church age, and soon you're going to come for your people. I, I pray that this has stood as, as evidence to that fact. And I pray, dear God, as we see the nearness of it coming, that we'll recommit our lives, we'll rededicate ourselves to serving you. Many in this room this morning have confessed their shortcomings. I ask you, Lord, that you would give them courage to commit themselves to French and new to you today. To serve you. To read the Word of God and study. To spend time in prayer. To share their faith with others. To do the work of God while there's still time. God, just bless us. Lead us now to make our decisions for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I ask you if you will to stand to your feet quietly, please, and reverently. Again, every head bowed, no one looking around. If you made a sincere commitment to Christ this morning, I'd ask you to step out and make it as a public decision. You say, why is that? Well, that? well, I don't know. That's just the way Jesus did it. He always required His disciples to make a public commitment to Him. So if you made that commitment, I'll just ask you to come down here, grab Brother David by the hand. Listen, you don't have to give him your whole life story. So easy, just come down here, shake his hand, and say, Brother Dave, I want you to know I'm, I'm recommitting my heart to Christ. I'm rededicating myself to live for the Lord. I don't know how much I got left, but whatever I got left, I'm going to live for Jesus. You come, it's a music play.